Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to continue our look at the generated structures you can find in Minecraft's overworld, and we're going to start by heading back to one that we're fairly familiar with. We've spotted a few of these from a distance, but we've never really tangled with the inhabitants, and I think today is the day we're going to rush a pillager outpost. On the way, since we found a cow, I'm going to pick up a bucket of milk, because we will need to dispel a status effect that we get from fighting the inhabitants of this place, and I want to show you this on camera because it's worth bearing in mind. So out here on the plains we have pillager outpost number one, a dark oak watchtower with mossy cobblestone and vines growing from it. You'll also, once you get closer, notice the presence of a few ominous banners, and you'll also find that they have these holding cells and practice dummies out here along with wood piles and occasional tents, which indicate that this is a pillager camp. There we go, we're close enough now to have the banners render in. Those ominous banners that you see swinging from the sides of the structure are kind of indications that this is pillager territory. Now previously I said it would be a bad idea for villagers to set up anywhere near a pillager outpost and some folks in the comments even let me know that they have seen pillager outposts and villagers spawn in very close proximity to each other. But I promise there is no actual correlation. A pillager outpost is not the sign of a village. The fact is the two are only related because they appear in the same biomes. In a biome where villagers can spawn there is also a chance for a pillager watchtower to generate. And in a radius around the watchtower you'll find these guys spawning, the pillagers with crossbows who you've occasionally seen wandering around the world as pillager patrols. Occasionally you'll see ones with banners above their heads, the same banners that hang from the sides of the watchtower, and it's those that we really need to watch out for as we approach this structure. And there is one right now, you can see the banner approaching us and the pillager himself is looking at us with intent now that we've got within a reasonable distance. We're going to attack and kill this guy and he is going to give us the Bad Omen status effect, getting us the Advancement Voluntary Exile, and he will drop one of the ominous banners that you see hanging from the outside of the platform here. And there are a few other pillagers without that ominous banner gathering around the outpost here and guarding the entrance. So we're going to dispatch a couple more of these, like so, and we're going to make our way in. Now pillagers will spawn in a radius around and including the watchtower, so we've got to be a little bit careful as we come up the stairs here, but it seems like nobody is really at home, which is a good thing. Once we get up to to the top here you will find one loot chest which usually doesn't contain very interesting stuff. It's got an iron ingot, a little bit of wood, some wheat and some arrows, all of which can potentially be put towards a crossbow except for the wheat which is used for the hay bales that they have outside in their practice dummies. It seems like they've also been shearing the edges of this tree which is a little strange but I think that's probably just the game clearing an area for the pillager outpost to generate in the first place. So we're going to hop out the side of this and make our way out onto the plains probably running away from a few of these pillagers. But the main thing we need to be concerned about here is the fact that we now have this bad omen status effect and what that means is when we walk into a village there is the potential for us to start a raid. A raid is basically an invasion by pillagers and their friends the other illagers which are evokers, witches, vindicators and ravagers, the few other illager type mobs that you'll find in the game. Ravagers are massive animals which can pretty much go toe to toe with an iron golem. An iron golem will pretty much beat one in a one on one fair fight but ravagers pack a heck of a punch. They're definitely like the cavalry of the illagers. So because people get confused between this, illagers are like a category of mobs which includes pillagers. They're basically villagers but with grey faces and mean looking expressions. Right now you'll notice that we just have a bad omen. It doesn't say anything about a level of the status effect but if we end up killing another banner wearing pillager captain that is going to bump up our bad omen level to level 2 to a maximum of level 5. Every time you kill one of these pillager captains when a raid is not happening you'll end up increasing your bad omen level. For example there's one right here so let's give him a couple of well aimed shots there we go and now the firing squad has found us so I need to make a pretty speedy escape. From a safe distance I can open up my potions hut and now we can see that we have bad omen 2. So evidently every time you kill one of those banner wearing captains the bad omen level goes up. I tell you the other bad omen that's just happened it's just started raining but every additional bad omen level adds a wave at the end of a pillager raid so you do need to bear in 
in mind that the more bad omen you have, the longer that raid is going to continue for, provided you can keep the villagers alive, because the pillagers will enter villager houses and try and hunt down any of the villagers who remain outside. In order to avoid that, we're going to drink a bucket of milk and dispel that bad omen effect, and that is really all we needed to cover for pillager watchtowers. You will also find pillagers arriving around your world in patrols, usually led by one of the banner-wearing captains, and when the captain drops their banner, the other pillagers will sometimes attempt to pick it up, so assuming the role of the captain, you can potentially get up to a high enough bad omen level just from one pillager patrol. The difference is pillager patrols will spawn randomly. We don't always know when they're going to show up, they mostly show up during the day in areas that players haven't lit up, and they're some of the only hostile mobs that spawn during the day instead of at night. Pillager outposts like this are basically a guaranteed way of being able to go and get bad omen whenever you want to, which is ideal if you want to start a raid intentionally and you don't want to wait around for a pillager patrol to show up. But that's all they're really needed for. As we can see from the loot in our inventory, that barely qualifies as loot. There's one iron ingot and some wood, <laughs> the kind of stuff that we can get more or less anywhere in the world and probably get more of under our own steam. While you might get occasional emeralds from pillager outposts, unless you are really hurting for emeralds and you haven't found a village yet and you just desperately want something to trade from the wandering trader, it's not really worth the crossbow bolts in the back. So we're going to leave this structure behind and we're going to go on a bit of an adventure. Having hung up the banner in here as a trophy, we're going to head through the nether to one of the nether portals that we set up in the previous episodes. We've got one by the ocean monument and we've got one at the jungle temple, but we're going to find the one that's all the way out to the east in that desert temple, because from there, we're going to navigate to a location I found on a recent live stream. And I've been exploring the overworld a little bit on my live streams, just so I can make the episodes here a little bit easier, because what we are looking for is a snow biome. And snow biomes, it turns out, aren't all that common in this world. They're even less common than deserts as far as I can tell because I had to travel about 7,000 blocks to even find a snowy biome in the first place. Aside from the groves and frozen peaks that we'd explored in previous episodes, but they don't really count for what I have in mind. So as I was digging this nether tunnel out towards the location of my desert temple, I happened upon a warped forest, one of the last biomes that we hadn't yet found in the nether. So I decided I was going to dig around the warped forest so that I didn't end up getting the achievement for exploring all of the nether biomes so that we could get that to together in an episode, but unfortunately the game had other plans, and once I ended up walking through this tunnel, I dug my way into a warped forest, the fog colour changed, and we got an achievement. The achievement in question, exploring all the nether biomes, requires you to visit a nether waste, a soul sand valley, a warped forest, a crimson forest, and a basalt delta, all of which we had been to with the exception of the warped forest, so we ended up getting hot tourist destinations there on the stream. It's basically the nether's equivalent of the adventuring time advancement for discovering every biome in the game in total, including ones from the nether and the end dimension as well, but in this case we ended up getting the achievement for exploring all the nether biomes. We also ended up getting the achievement for destroying a ghast with its own fireball. Love to hear ghasts when I'm doing this. Don't get returned to sender. Dang it. Which, once again, I had hoped to do in an episode for the first time, but we haven't really spent as much time together in the nether. And I was hoping we'd end up doing that when we explored bastions or something like that. Which, by the way, there is a fantastic example of a bastion right here in our warped forest. So we'll be returning to that in future, because it's quite easy to get to. Warped forests are the cyan equivalent of the crimson forest's deep red, and you can often find endermen walking around in these biomes, making them a really good way to hunt for ender pearls if you are short on those in the early game. And and frankly, I'm probably going to leave the Enderman alone for now because I have other plans, but we'll get back to Warped Forests in a future episode of the guide. For now, though, after all of this running, and you can tell that I've unloaded the chunks here because all of the items are still here from where I was digging, we should find our way out to this. The most precarious of our nether portals, but one which we should hopefully be able to get to nice and easily. All we got to do is hop up here, and we should probably make some fortifications to this nether portal at some stage, but as long as there's no ghasts around, there we go. We're out here at the desert temple and from here we should be able to make our way I think a little bit further east and a little way north so that we're heading back towards the negative Z coordinates because where we're looking at is potentially a lot further east than this. Having said that, we just saved ourselves a whole bunch of time by taking that nether portal because we ended up traveling about 4,000 blocks in the overworld by traveling about 500 blocks in the nether. I'll bring you folks back in if there are any interesting landmarks between here and the snow plains biome, but otherwise I've got a lot of traveling to do, so I'll see you folks on the other side. 
So we are still a good distance away from our destination, but it seems like the cold biomes have already started. Right here is one of the keys to it, especially if you're exploring via the ocean here. Frozen ocean biomes will start to generate in areas where the world gets a little frostier. And as you can see, we've got some icebergs around here. We have ice flows that we can walk on on the surface. In fact, we can do some fun stuff with boats around here as well, because it turns out if you place a boat down on ice, the momentum you pick up, the inertia that you gather, is a little bit faster than your standard way of rowing. <laughs> so we are now drifting wildly down a frozen river. And as we reach the actual river part, you'll notice a village is over here. We've got ourselves a tidy little frozen village, which is one of the things I wanted to show you folks today. I'd found a different frozen village in another location, but it turns out there are villagers living out out here as well. Their routines are going to be much the same as the villages that we handled in the savannah. The location of the village, the biome that the village is in, doesn't really affect the way villagers operate. Mostly just affects their clothes, the kind of loot that you'll find in their houses, and occasionally some of the professions that are out here. But I kind of like these villagers' style. They've got these funky little toque kind of hats on, and they look very warm and cozy in these spruce houses. As we cross the river into the forest, there might even be one or two igloo-style houses like this one. These are made out of blue ice and snow blocks, and blue ice is kind of similar to packed ice, it's even more packed ice basically, and it is the slippiest block in Minecraft. As you can see, the loot in these chests is fairly random in much the same way that you'll find other loot chests in other villages, but in this case, there is some beetroot soup, so we're going to take that because beetroot soup is sort of the local delicacy of these snow plains villages. They will often grow beets in some of the farms around here, and beetroot soup is something the player can make themselves. If you grow beets, you can make a bowl and six beets into some beetroot soup. It's not the most nutritious food, but it's always worth knowing about in case you need it. I'm going to take a quick look around the snow plains here because while we're not expecting any unusual caves, we are looking for another structure out here, and it's an igloo, but not an igloo like the ones that you will find in the Snow Plains villages. This igloo looks a little bit more cartoony, a little bit more kind of traditional looking, and it has a chance to appear in Snow Plains biomes. And I did locate a couple of igloos already, but I want to look around and see if there are any around here. Not seeing a whole lot of them. What I am seeing a lot of is this snowy tiger biome, which is a variant of the regular tiger biome. You'll just find a bunch of spruce wood around here, but you'll also find arctic foxes around here, which are a white variant of the red foxes that you find in an ordinary tiger biome. You also won't find as many sweet berry bushes growing in snowy tigers, but aside from that, there are ferns, there is grass, there's pretty much the same biome. In fact, you could be fooled into thinking this was a grove biome, except grove biomes have the full snow blocks in them, where the regular snowy tigers just have grass blocks with snow layers on the top. Honestly, I really like finding lakes in snowy areas like this because <laughs> they make for pretty cool skating rinks and it gets a little bit nauseating sometimes, but you can have a lot of fun out here on a large enough lake with a couple of players and a couple of boats. Right up there, you can actually see that this does turn into a grove biome right there. The spruce wood just transitions neatly into this area with more powder snow around. So it's kind of interesting to see that while we're out here. Out on the other side of this snowy tiger though, it seems like the landscape blends back into a frozen ocean. So I'm going to explore the ocean a little bit more. We're going to head back to the coordinates I found on my stream and we're going to see if we can check out the igloos I was talking about. You remember the different types of ice I was talking about? Well out here in these frozen oceans you can actually find all three types of ice in the icebergs around you. And here's a really good example of it. You'll notice there is packed ice all around here except for those blocks of blue ice like the ones we're currently sat next to. You'll also find those ice flows are made out of regular ice that's a little bit more transparent. And while of course these are fantastic waterscapes to look at, I always enjoy rowing my way through iceberg biomes. If you want a large amount of the stuff, there is no better place to come than an ice biome like this because you'll just be able to take down as much as you want and barely make a dent in the overall landscape. In these colder biomes you will also find polar bears walking around on the ice flows and polar bears are usually neutral towards the player. However, beware if there is a cub around. If there is a younger polar bear, then the polar bears will get territorial and attempt to defend their cubs so they'll attack a player if they get close. That's all you really need to worry about with polar bears, though they're not quite as vicious as real life polar bears are, and frankly, they don't really have much of a place in the game. If you kill one, all they do is drop salmon. So, considering we can fish up salmon en masse from places out here in the wild, we don't really need to worry too much about dealing with the polar bears. 
There's one with a cub right there. So we're going to get no closer than this. But the polar bear will get angry at you if you approach the cub. So probably best that we keep our distance. Okay, folks, we're coming up on the coordinates that I expected us to head towards. And here is our first igloo and they don't look like much from the outside but these igloos are occasionally very worth the player finding them as we head inside you'll notice there's a bed in here there's a crafting table and a furnace a redstone torch here and a little bit of carpet on the floor the key to whether or not these igloos hello <laughs> we've got golden carrots in my hand that's why the rabbits are a little bit interested in the fact that i'm holding some variant on a carrot anyway the the main thing we need to be concerned about in here the main thing that makes igloos at all interesting to the player is whether or not they have a trap door under this carpet and luckily for us the first igloo we encountered does this trap door occurs in a small percentage of igloos it's not all of them but it is some of them and as we head down here we find that there have been people here before and they might have had some interesting objectives as we come down here we'll start to hear a zombie villager and you'll notice that there is a zombie villager and a regular villager in adjacent holding cells with a sign with arrows pointing between the two of them you'll also find a cauldron in here you will find a free brewing stand although it doesn't have any fuel in it it does have a splash potion of weakness and if we turn to this chest over here the chest contains golden apples a little bit of extra food and even some supplies to make an additional golden apple although you need a little bit more gold than this these igloo research stations as i think of them are basically the game's way of signposting the fact that you can cure zombified villagers and it's a topic we've obviously discussed in the guide before because we already knew about it but the fact remains if you find one of these igloos having not yet found a village you have an opportunity to cure a zombified villager and even get a few discounts before you've encountered a regular village we're going to return to the surface here while that villager is curing and while night is falling because the snow plains out here some of these colder biomes have a unique mob that i'm kind of interested to take a look at while we're here in today's episode there is a variant of skeletons that spawns in these snow biomes called a stray and there's one on the hilltop right now strays appear like regular skeletons but wearing ragged gray clothing and here's one that spawned a little bit closer you'll notice that the arrows it's firing at us actually trail potion particles behind them so i'm gonna block one of those real fast go in and attack the stray and he got me so that's actually applied a slowness effect to us because these skeletons fire potion tipped arrows at you as we kill the skeleton, you'll notice that it dropped a different kind of arrow to the usual, and that is an arrow of slowness, an arrow with a potion effect applied to it. Strays are the only types of mobs that fire these tipped arrows, and as you can see, we just ended up firing the arrow back at it. But you'll notice the arrow got consumed, even though my bow normally has infinity on it and doesn't consume other arrows. So it's important to note that infinity and potion tipped arrows are not really compatible. In the same way that spectral arrows that you trade from piglins will be consumed by infinity so will potion tipped arrows like the ones we can gather from strays bedrock edition players might be a little bit more familiar with potion tipped arrows and you might remember getting some of them in the trades from the fletchers that we traded with over in the savannah village because potion tipped arrows are available to the player although on java edition you don't really get to do much with them until you can craft lingering potions which are something that we'll need to go to the end dimension and fight the ender dragon for but while the night continues outside we're coming back down to our research station to check on our zombie villager here you'll also notice that there is a bed up there in the igloo which we could bring down here and place nearby to the zombie villager to increase the speed at which he cures you'll also have iron bars in here and the villagers cell on the left hand side here and that indicates that the iron bars are actually what ends up curing them a little bit faster but once again you need 14 iron bars for the maximum effect there this villager doesn't really care what he's up to he's just kind of standing in his booth here and in fact if we let this villager out he's probably going to try and sleep in this bed maybe even attached to the cauldron or the brewing stand as his workstation and take on a profession another thing to note is that these igloos also have cacti in flower pots so if you've had a hard time finding cactus like i had for the last little while then you might even want to take the cactus out of the flower pot and bring that with you to grow back at your base and there goes our villager he's just cured from being a zombified cleric into being an ordinary unemployed villager for the moment and if we wanted to we could let both of these villagers out now that the villagers are able to adopt professions naturally the one who we cured has 
zombification discounts, much like the villagers in the Savannah village. So in this case, igloos are really a nice hint to the player if you've never tried the zombification thing before to give it a try in controlled conditions, and they'll even provide the resources for you to do it. I realized I left my coal in this chest earlier, so I'm going to grab all of that before I go, but we don't really need to do a whole lot else with the stuff that's in here. We could turn the wheat into bread and throw it to these villagers. We could even use this as an opportunity to start our own village out here in the snow plains, although it's pretty clear that there are other villages around the place, so we might end up just going to find one of those instead. Back here on the surface, it's still night time, as you can tell from the fact that I just got shot by a stray, but we can use the bed here in the igloo to sleep for the night, and then hopefully we'll be able to get out and explore in the morning. Strays, much like other skeletons, will burn in sunlight, so you don't need to worry too much about those sticking around in the morning. Now even further east and a little bit back towards the south, we stumble upon another snowy village here, and you can see that some of these houses are actually made entirely out of snow blocks in the same way that the igloo are, so don't get too confused between the two. The igloos are a little bit smaller and have a single pane of ice. In fact, there is one right over here, so we can see the difference between the two. These are a little bit shorter, a little bit rounder, and don't have a door on the front of them indicating that they're not really part of a village house. Does this one? Oh, this one has a research station under it as well. Okay, so I'm actually finding more than not. Another interesting fact about the igloos here is that the redstone torch is giving off light, so they will spawn proof some of the solid blocks here in the igloo, allowing you to get some rest in here without any mobs spawning. However, it's not giving off enough light to melt the block of ice that kind of acts as the window of these igloos. Whereas if you replace the redstone torch with a regular torch, that actually gives off a little bit more light. And eventually, after a second or two, this ice block is going to melt completely. There we go. <laughs> the window just melted. And in order to repair that, we're going to go back to the nearest river and collect an ice block so that we can pop that back in the window and not flood the entire place. Kind of neat though, because redstone torches only give off a light level of seven, whereas a regular torch gives off twice that light level. And I think ice melts around light level 11. So a redstone Stone torch is entirely safe to light up some of the surroundings here. Now let's go down to this research station. We're probably not going to cure the zombie villager down here because I'm not planning on sticking around this area for too long, but we are going to take the golden apple from the chest because I'm nothing if not mercenary. <laughs> yeah, we got one golden apple in there, a little bit more coal, a few more regular apples and some wheat once again. Not too shabby, but once again, we're not going to worry about curing the zombie villager. We're just going to take the splash potion of weakness and be on our merry way. Oh, and as we step outside, it's even snowing. How wonderful. I haven't had a chance chance to demonstrate snow yet, so this is kind of an interesting circumstance really. Snow is just what happens when it rains in a cold enough biome, or at high enough elevation in certain biomes like mountains. You'll often find that some mountains don't have snow on the ground, but if you're in a high enough elevation and it starts to rain, you'll notice that some of it falls as snow particles. And snow will actually settle on the ground. If we dig up a large enough area here, and my shovel is so efficient that I ended up tearing up the ground a little bit in the process, we'll actually see that if we break, let's say, a square area right here, as the snow falls, it will start to form snow layers randomly on areas of the ground that it hasn't already covered. It will do this on any solid blocks that don't have anything above them, like grass over here, for example, and it won't do it on things like slabs if they're bottom half slabs, but it will settle on the top half as though it's the top of a full block. There we go, the snow layers are starting to fill in a little bit at the edges. And we'll talk about ice and snow another time because there are some really interesting, fascinating mechanics that we can cover when it comes to this stuff, including the fact that we can farm powdered snow in snowy biomes like this if we place cauldrons around and they'll start to fill up with snow that we can grab as though it were powdered snow from a grove or a snowy slopes biome. But that is about it for our first trip to this snowy wonderland. I do hope you've enjoyed this look at igloos and pillager outposts, along with some of the other structures we can expect to find here in snowy biomes. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixelriffs. Please don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.